Hear the word of God from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. This reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. Through this, he received approval as righteous, God himself giving approval to his gifts. He died, but through his faith, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For it was attested before he was taken away that he had pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, warned by God about events as yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. The word of God for the world. Thanks be to God. Last week, the National Football League kicked off its 100th season with the annual Hall of Fame induction ceremony in Canton, Ohio. I remember the first and only time I went to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. The year was 1996. I was there to look at the statue and the tribute to one of my all-time favorite sports heroes, Leroy Selman a longtime beloved Tampa Bay Buccaneer and gift to the Tampa Bay community who was enshrined in the Hall of Fame the year before. Leroy Selman's speech when he was inducted contained all of the things you would expect in a speech like that. He thanked his teammates, he acknowledged and praised his long line of coaches. But his speech also included something very interesting. He included a very lengthy reference to the Bible. He talked about two of his favorite biblical heroes, Abraham and Sarah. He actually told the entire story of Abraham and Sarah in the book of Genesis right in the middle of his Hall of Fame induction speech, if you can imagine. And as he told their story, he, he talked about how they inspired him to hold on to his faith how their perseverance amidst the adversity that they faced encouraged him to hold on to his tenacity and his faithfulness even as he encountered the struggles of his own life. In other words, right in the middle of his Hall of Fame induction speech, he found his own story in the stories of Abraham and Sarah, and he made their lives a part of his own. And what we discovered in that speech by the great Leroy Selman was that he not only had a Hall of Fame career, he had a Hall of Fame faith. Do you know that the Bible has a Hall of Fame too? It's not in Cooperstown, it's not in Canton, it's not filled with statues, it's filled with stories. The closest the Bible comes to a Hall of Fame is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the opening of which you just heard moments ago. Story after story of some of the Bible's greatest heroes, 15 inductees in the biblical Hall of Fame listed by name, hundreds of others that are referenced in there. But in this new series that we're going to use for the next four weeks, called a hall of faith, we're going to be looking at these biblical heroes in Hebrews chapter 11, looking at three in particular. 
We'll look at Moses, the great liberator of the slaves in Egypt. We will look at Abraham and Sarah, two of the greatest heroes that ever lived, the the keepers of the promise, the ancestors of the faith. Without them, we wouldn't even be here. And then our story for today, the first biblical hero of our series, Noah, the builder of the ark. But before we even get to those names, I want to draw your attention to the way Hebrews 11 begins, verse 1, because it's there that we receive the fullest and most succinct definition of faith. If you want to know how the Bible defines faith, then just look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It's going to be the connecting thread through these upcoming four Sundays. It's one that we've listed for you in your bulletin insert today, along with space for you to take notes. Here is the key verse, not only for today, but in the month ahead. Hebrews says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's your definition of faith. It reminds us that faith is not based on evidence that you can see, it's based on evidence that you can't see, which sounds utterly counterintuitive because when you think about evidence, you think about things you can see and touch and sense, but that's not faith, Hebrews says. Faith is based on things you cannot see. Even when everything around you says that something is impossible, faith pushes you forward. Even when all the evidence around you suggests nothing but darkness and gloom, faith convinces you that there are brighter days ahead. And that's why the word hope is found in this definition of faith, because in the biblical world, faith and hope are inextricably linked. You cannot have faith without claiming hope, and if you want hope in your life, then you need faith. Faith and hope are together, and that is the way you are called to live. In fact, here's your assignment. You thought the students were the only ones that had homework in the upcoming year. You have an assignment over these next four Sundays. As we go through each of these stories, here's your invitation to find your story in the stories of the Hebrews Hall of Fame to look at your life in the context of the lives that we will study. In other words, to pull a Leroy Selman, to find your story in the lives of these heroes that we will learn about. That is what we are called to do, so that as we look at these Hall of Fame faithful, you can have a Hall of Fame faith. Now, all these stories that we're going to study are are very different. They have different plot lines. They have different characters and contexts, very unique qualities to them. But there is one, one thread that ties them all together, one set, one outline that connects all of these stories into one, four mile markers, if you will, four parts to the outline that each of these stories follow. Number one, Each of these people were chosen by God to do a special thing. They didn't, they may not have realized it, they might have been reluctant to be chosen, but they were each chosen by God. Number two, each of them said yes to God. They might have been tempted to say otherwise, they might have wrestled internally with whether to say yes, but they all did. They were chosen and they said yes, but life did not get easier for them because number three, all of them struggled. Because they said yes to God, they experienced adversity, temptation, and a, and, and wayward, a, a, a pull to pull them away from God. But you know what each of these stories have in common? At the end, the fourth element is that God helped them through their struggles, and they became a gift to the world. They helped change the world because they said yes and because God helped them through their struggles. Those are the four points that tie all of these heroes' journeys together in the book of Hebrews. That's what's going to tie them all together in these upcoming Sundays. But there's more than that, because Hebrews takes it one step further and invites you to follow that same outline in your life. 
Little did we know that these, these stories in Hebrews are actually an invitation for you to follow those four same steps in the life of faith. It's going to be the common thread for all of these stories, and in fact, we've listed it for you in the insert today. This is the same journey that has those same milestones. Number one, God has chosen you. You may not realize it. You may be reluctant to admit it, but God has chosen you for a special task. And what you have to do, number two, is say yes to God. You may be tempted to say no. You might have struggles within, but God wants a yes from you. And it won't always be easy because, in fact, number three, your life may be full of struggles as you decide to follow this Jesus, follow this God into this mission. But it's all worth it because with God, you can not only survive those struggles, you can be a gift to others. God has chosen you. You have to say yes to God, and there may be struggles, but God will help you through it so you can be a gift to others. On your insert this morning as well is a great quote by beloved actor Christopher Reeve. He's best known for playing the part of one of the most iconic film superheroes in history, Superman. Christopher Reeve once defined a hero as this. He said, a hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. An ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure despite overwhelming obstacles. And each of the heroes in Hebrews 11 did just that. God chose them. They say yes. They were ordinary individuals who exhibited an extraordinary faith against adversity, and they became a gift to others. And in fact, that is your calling too. That is the hall of fame faith that God is calling you to live. And that leads us to Noah. I think most of us are familiar with the general story of Noah, right? We know about the ark. We know about the animals and the great flood and the rainbow at the end. We, we know this story very well. But what's fascinating about the story of Noah in the book of Genesis is that before we learn about any of that, here is what we learn about Noah, that he was a righteous man. In fact, Genesis would take it one step further. He was not only a good man, not just a moral man, he was a faithful man, an obedient man to God. And in fact, he was the only one left on earth who was. Genesis goes into great detail to explain how everybody else in the world lived. Everybody else in the world, according to Genesis, was wicked sinful. Their internal motivations were oriented away from God. They were prone to violence and hatred and destruction of the planet and each other. And the sum result of that in Genesis is that God's heart was greatly grieved. We learn something about the emotional capacity of God in Genesis. That when human beings are in self-destruct mode, God's heart breaks. And that's what was happening at the opening of the Noah story, it got to the point where God decided the only thing that could be done was a full reboot of humanity. Not of all creation. I mean, God wasn't going to destroy the whole universe and start over. Just humanity was the problem. And what God decided was that humanity needed a second chance. And the way to introduce that second chance is by calling an ordinary individual a person who God had chosen to spark a catalyst of change, and that is what God called Noah to do. I want to share with you the one principle that I think is most important for us to hear from the Noah story. The one thing that can give us both challenge and comfort as we take a look at the condition of the world today. You too might have your heart deeply grieved by all of the sadness and wickedness and darkness and despair in the world around us. As you take a look at your community or your workplace or, or your, your, your school or your neighborhood or, or certainly the country in the world, you might have your heart breaking just like God's heart broke in Genesis. You might even feel like you are the only one 
who cares about this stuff. You might certainly feel like you are utterly helpless to do anything about it. You might feel scared, fearful, and lonely. You might even feel tempted to walk away from God. Give in to the darkness and go along with the way the world is. But here is the principle that we learn from heroic old Noah. You may feel like the only one, but maybe you're just the first one. You may feel like you're the only one, but maybe you're just the first one. Noah shows us that you might be the spark. You might be the first piece. You might be the catalyst. You might be just an ordinary individual through which God wants to reboot the world, to reboot the brokenness of our time into something better. God may be calling you to be the first in a long succession of people who will cult come after you, who will ultimately transform your workplace, your neighborhood, your family, your community, even this country and the world, back into the way God wants it to be. That's exactly what God called Noah to be, the first one, the first of a new kind of humanity. Step one, God chose Noah, just as God is choosing you. And did Noah say yes? Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, we don't have record of him verbally saying yes. In fact, we don't have record of Noah saying anything at all. We get the impression that as soon as God downloaded the blueprints of the ark down to Noah, Noah didn't say anything in response, no pushback, no second guessing, no questioning of God. As soon as he got those plans, Noah picked up his hammer and got to work. Noah said yes. He might have been ambivalent. He might have been reluctant. But he said yes with his actions. But did he struggle? Oh, you can imagine that he did. You can imagine the taunts and the, the jeers and the teasing of all the people who around him who are watching him build this crazy ark and questioning what he was doing, you can imagine all of the skeptics that were teasing him every single day. Can you hear them? Can you imagine the people who said, come on, Noah, what do you mean it's going to flood? There's no such thing. This, this planet is going to be fine. They were clearly the world's first deniers of global climate change. Can you imagine those people who said, come on, Noah, you know there really is no God. You know that what you were really hearing was just a projection of your subconscious. Quit believing in God. Quit, quit saying that you are talking to some deity. Quit believing in some higher power. Clearly, these were the world's first religious skeptics. Can you imagine those people who said, come on, Noah, what do you mean God is upset with us? We're fine. The way we're living is great, just the way we are. There's no need to change the status quo. These were people who were blind to their sinfulness and their wickedness. When it comes to living the life of faith, our world is very much the same. And you and I struggle with those same voices, some of those voices within us, by the way. But Noah is a hero to us because, as Christopher Reeve said, he was just an ordinary individual who, perceived, who persevered and endured and overcame all sorts of obstacles until the very end. God chose Noah. God, God heard Noah say yes. Noah certainly did struggle. But number four, Noah became a gift to the world. During my freshman year in college, I felt lost. I think about my freshman year often during this time of year as we start a brand new school year for our students. It's vivid for me especially since my older daughter Grace went off to college yesterday. And I think about my own first year of college. It was very rough for me. Despite growing up with a Christian upbringing, my first year of college I was surrounded by people who thought that my Christian faith was nothing more than a fairy tale. 
I had a handful of professors, a number of classmates, had a ton of reading in various courses, but they were all challenging me to walk away from my belief in God, and I very nearly did. It was a wilderness experience in many ways for me, my fall semester of college. I went home during one of my breaks that fall and went back to my home church one Sunday, and there I found one of my high school Sunday school teachers, and I found a private moment with her so I could just pour my heart out with how my college experience was going. I told her how, how lonely I felt, how nervous I was, how worried I was about my faith, how I wondered whether I was the only one on that campus who believed in God and how I was feeling tempted to just walk away from all of it. I'll never forget the face of that Sunday school teacher. She was so gentle and kind. She just listened to my stories with a listening, empathetic ear. And after I finished pouring my heart out, I will never forget what she said to me. She said, McGray, on that campus, you may feel like the only one, but maybe you're just the first one. Those words utterly transformed my perspective, changed the way I looked at my experience on that campus, put me in a different direction. I could vividly hear in that moment God calling me, God choosing me, and wondering whether I was going to say yes. When I got back to campus that second semester, I decided to start a new club, I called it Cornerstone, a chance for Christians to gather together, to support each other, pray for each other. And what I discovered was that God had been busy calling lots of other people on that campus tugging on their hearts to find each other. We had no idea we even existed on that campus, but because of that club, we found each other, just a handful of us. And as the years went by, the handful of us became a dozen more, and then dozens and dozens of others by the time we graduated as seniors. You may not see yourself as Noah. I get that. You may not see yourself as Abraham or Sarah or Moses, but God does. God sees in you more potential than you see in yourself, actually, and that is why God has chosen you. To what? I don't know. But you and God will know. And the only question is whether you will say yes to some new mission so that God can reboot this broken world through you. It might start as just little things that God is calling you to do, some new relationships that you can work on, some, some project that you are being called to take on, but God is calling you to say yes. And you can rest assured there will be struggles. Not a single biblical hero has escaped struggles as a result of their saying yes. But you know what? In the end, it's worth it because through those struggles, God can use you to be a gift to the world. You are just an ordinary individual called to persevere and endure against overwhelming obstacles so that through you, God can do some rebooting. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this story of Noah. Many of us learned it as children now we have to live it as adults. We thank you for your grace that enables us to overcome our skepticism, our fear, enables us to say yes to this grand mission that you've called us to, and helps us to confront the darkness of this world with perseverance and endurance so that through us you might be a gift to the world. Inspire us over these next four Sundays as we learn about these Hall of Fame heroes. May they teach all of us practical ways to, help, to have a faith worthy of the Hebrews Hall of Fame. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Let all God's people say, amen. And so in response to God's word this morning, we invite you to prepare your tithes, your gifts, your offerings, the commitments of your hearts, your prayer concerns, and your joys on those prayer cards as we invite the ushers to come forward at this time.